eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. of Yacht Engineering Week 2021. I am Heather Lee O'Keefe, your co-host here with Paul Flannery. Paul, what do we have in store today? Well, good morning, Heather. We've got uh, a variety of things to talk about today. We've got top coats and bottom paints from Asco Noble. We've got a discussion with Isotropic about connectivity, and we're gonna finish up our day with your discussion with the folks over at Fire Ranger. I sure am. I think you have the first assignment today, though. I not only have the first assignment, Heather, I'm gonna sit back and have a coffee, cup of coffee because mine's already in the can. Lee, roll the tape. All right, and welcome aboard. We're here at this point with uh, Jim Hogan from Asco Noble. Asco Noble is the parent company that owns Allgrip and Interlux, two of the best known products in the industry. Jim, thanks for joining us this morning. Sure thing, Paul, you're I'm, welcome. I'm looking forward to a little explanation about uh, top coats, about shine. We'll talk a little bit about bottom coating uh, sure. at the latter part of the segment. But we're on board one of the boats that's in process right now over at LMC of having a full paint done. Correct. So as, as people can see behind me, we've, we've got a lot of blue in the picture. And yep. that blue, if I'm not mistaken, is part of the intermediary process between a boat that comes in and needs to be painted and a boat that goes out with a good fresh shine on it. Yeah, exactly. And we've all grown up knowing that uh, uh, anything that's successful in painting, uh, uh, you have to have a, a proper preparation. If you skip steps in the proper in the preparation process, then you're likely not to have a good outcome. Well, exactly. Your your highest shines are the ones that are most susceptible to showing any defects. That's correct. So the work is all in the prep. And also, the darker the color, the more it will show defects. Also, that's why we so don't paint them black. To, exactly. <laughs> it's very important to identify where you may have some highs or lows in the finish. Right. And that's one of the reasons why they use a, a product like this. Uh, this dye right here, right. so that when they uh, when they begin the preparation process and they're sanding that, wherever there may be some of the material left behind, that would indicate a low area where the applicator would then build that area back out in order to give them a you know a properly profiled finish before they apply finish primer to it in right. preparation for top coating. So this boat in particular, where where we stand is she was brought in, she was evaluated, she was assessed, they gave a quote for a job. Then what they did is they started to disassemble. So they took off all loose goods, all the hardware. They start by sanding. They do a quick initial sand and then they go with the blue dicom. So that indicates low spots for their next sand prior to primer. Correct. Okay. That's right. And then after that, what they'll do is they'll squirt primer. Yes. Well, before they do that, once they've identified everything, they'll go ahead and fill those in usually with an epoxy filler. The reason why we recommend epoxies, uh, they have very low shrinkage rates right. as opposed to polyester fillers, which have a high shrinkage rate. Okay. So you could create dimples in the finish, if you will, by choosing an improper filler like a polyester and not an epoxy. So once they've done that and then they uh, block those areas out, what I mean by blocking is uh, you have to take a, a sanding device that is uh, bigger than the area you're sanding and you block that area. That way the entire area around that, that area you just repaired is, is smooth. There's no dips or highs or lows in it. That's why you would use a block. In fact, some of the boats, we see them using something called a long board. Correct. Which is actually an elongated block that's a perfectly flat surface. Yep. And it gives them the ability to finish a surface pr prior to painting. That's right. It's perfectly smooth. Right. Okay. Yep. So once they've, uh, once they've uh, uh, completed that process, then they would begin to use um, an epoxy finish primer. And uh, 
the reason why we prefer to have epoxy finish primers, if you really want your boat to look good and you really want a shine that will last and look good, it's, it's important to use an epoxy primer. A lot of captains will ask me, the boat looks pretty good, do I really need to use a primer? And I'll explain to them that by not using a primer, you could encounter some issues uh, with the, uh, the surface. You could have dieback conditions, you could have surface contamination. So by using a finished primer, we eliminate those in the process. Well, it also enhances adhesion too. Absolutely, it? yeah, yeah. The, okay. uh, the 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 urethane top coats uh, they like to stick to epoxy primers. When we go down and we look at a boat that's got some shine on it, yep. we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between epoxies and urethane. Sure. And, and and that's one of the most common questions. But it we'll, is. We'll address that in a few minutes. Yeah. So where we are right now is in the process, and it's at its absolute worst. It looks worse now than when it came in needing paint. But I think this is a great opportunity for us to stop. We're gonna relocate. We're gonna get some good shine going behind us. Okay. And we'll have a conversation about what happens after the primer is applied. All right, Jim, so we got a sense of the importance of the prep. Um, it's about getting the surface smooth. It's about putting the right materials on for fillers and as, uh, as primers as well. Um, and then what the result is, hopefully, is a great top coat. We're gonna take a look at the shine on this one, but first, you know, there's something that I'd really like to talk about. There are a variety of different products that are offered in the marketplace for top coat. Mm -hmm. And there are linear polyurethanes, there are acrylics. Can you give us a short primer on what's the difference between these different chemical compounds? Sure, uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the, the, the top sides used in uh, the uh, yacht painting, uh, uh, going way back, the original one was a uh, linear polyester urethane, which is what all grip is. Uh, very durable, very chemical resistant, long lasting, has great uh, uh, um, uh, gloss to it or shine, if you like right. to use that word. Uh, pretty much the industry standard for uh, nearly 35 years. Right. Um, we then introduced, and other companies did also, what we call acrylic urethanes. Okay. The primary difference there is an acrylic urethane affords the applicator an opportunity to correct something if something goes wrong without having to repaint everything. Is that because of the way the polymers are suspended in the yeah, paint and it, how it happens when it cures? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, okay. it, 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 it's exactly why, right. The, uh, the polyester urethanes, LPUs, like all grip, uh, they have a very, very finite amount of uh, the uh, polyester resin that rises to the top to lock in everything. That's what gives it its great shine. And, and durability, chemical resistance, and everything, that's correct. But a, Whereas, nail, a nail is too much yeah, exactly, for it to resist. Well, it is, that's right. We're not bulletproof. And right. uh, you know, I've, I've had that term used before, and I tell folks, look, it's not bulletproof, but it's very durable. Um, but the acrylics, on the other hand, uh, they don't have that extreme durability that you find in a polyester urethane. So they have the ability to be uh, corrected if there's something wrong, whether it's a maybe some dust in the finish or a run or a sag, a, a nail or something scratches it, you can come back and repair that later. Okay. The, the, the linear polyester urethanes don't lend themselves to that because once you compromise that little bit of clear on the top of it, right. you open it up to uh, UV uh, degradation. And it's hard and to blend that clear You back get a little in. bit of a halo and right. it just, you know, it just doesn't look proper and no one's uh, happy with that. Okay. So acrylics uh, made it um, uh, possible for applicators to paint your boat and hey, I don't like this, there's a little bit of dust here. Okay, we'll take care of that. Right. And you didn't have any long-term detrimental effect from that area that was repaired. Okay. So having uh, those two on hand now for nearly 45 plus years, uh, acrylic urethane and polyester urethane, uh, the industry drove us towards looking at base coat clear coats. So base coat clear coats were really uh, uh, beneficial to us because over the years, especially in the last 10 to 12 years, many, many owners and captains are choosing metallic finishes. So a base coat clear coat system allows you to apply metallic base coat that is consistent, uh, doesn't have lighter dark spots in it. We call that modeling. Right. And the, uh, the clear gives you a repairable finish. Okay. So that is done very well, certainly for us, and I'm sure the other manufacturers also, base coat clear coats, when somebody wants a, a metallic finish. Lastly, what we've done is, and this boat here is an example of that, uh, we've introduced a high solids polyester urethane that is correctable or fixable. Okay. I don't mean to imply that you could polish the finish every year to shine it back right. up. You don't have to do that. But if you had a nail scratch or some dust or a fender rub or line chafing, you, know, you, could, you could hire an experienced applicator to correct that situation. Okay. So because it's a polyester, you get the durability, the chemical resistance, 
the strong shine or gloss to it, and the longevity to it. What does high solids mean? Well, it basically means that you have a product that is uh, uh, VOC compliant. VOC okay. stands for volatile organic compounds, compound, sure. which is a fancy way of saying solvent. Right. Uh, too much solvent evaporating into the air is what uh, uh, regulatory uh, bodies don't like. Well, a few years ago, people re people came to realize that in household painting, sure. they had to have low VOC paints, sure. and suddenly you could paint your room and still stand there and not suffocate that's right. from the, from that's the right. exhaust fumes from it. That, and that's the solvents yep. that are evaporating out of the paint as it dries. That's correct. It's not like the water goes away, right. it's a solvent that's right. actually leaving the paint. Okay. That's correct. So this, this latest addition uh, uh, to our product line, which we refer to as All Grip HDT, High Definition Top Coat, right. uh, gives us that uh, low VOC offering. Okay. So uh, if we do have um, a situation where regulatory bodies are looking after the applicator for their VOC emissions, right. they can substitute this top coat for the more traditional ones and maintain their, uh, their compliance with VOC issues. Well, and, and the reality of it is we're all recognizing that it's our job to take responsibility for the environment. Yes. We've been abusing it, yes. not intentionally, but we've come to learn a lot of the things that we've been doing have been detrimental. So the ability to use low VOCs makes a huge difference. No, and I think if there's any industry uh, on the planet that recognizes that, it's the boating business. Well, we're, you know, it's we, where we play. Exactly. So we, we want to keep the water clean and the air clean. We play in the best environment, and you're right. We want to keep the water clean. We want to keep the air clean. Um, we have workers. And we're worried about their safety. Absolutely. You know, they have families, children, things like that. Right. Um, PPE is a big issue for us, so we're right. constantly, uh, you know, advising our applicators, uh, you know, what type of uh, uh, PPE they should be wearing when they're spraying, because you mentioned how when the paint is gassing off, that solvent smell. Right. Although it smells nice, it's not good for you. No, it's not. Right. I, 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 we had a conversation actually a few days ago about the early days of squirting uh, linear polyurethanes right. and how we didn't really take such <coughs> yeah, good I don't know if we're allowed to talk about that, are we? <laughs> exactly. No, but it's well, true, we've learned a lot. And, yeah. the sh and the shines that we're able to bring forward now with all the chemical research and all of the uh, enhancements and advancements in these paints is spectacular, as is evidenced by that boat behind us. Another thing that's interesting that's evidenced behind us on this boat is that when it comes to bottom paints and anti-fouling, obviously preparation is just as important as it is on our top coats. You, you would be surprised, Paul, and a lot of people have a tendency to kind of overlook that because they just say, oh, well, it's just anti-fouling paint. Just roll out another coat. Well, what do you want that anti-fouling paint to do? Well, right. I want it to not reduce speed. I want it to protect my vessel from uh, uh, under, underwater growth, barnacles, grass. I want it to uh, adhere I, properly. I, exactly, right. You know, So uh, there's an awful lot of uh, um, consideration of preparation for anti-foulings also, just like they're off for top coats. So as you can see here, they've obviously sanded this bottom. Yep. They found some low spots. They've patched them in, they've blended them in. They're gonna probably come back over and give it a light sand, and then they're gonna go ahead and, well, they've got a primer on there now. That's correct. So they'll yeah. go back into a top coat here. And, and again, just as in the top coats, they use epoxy primers also. Right, so great uh, adhesion. that's for adhesion, exactly, uh, durability. Right. And uh, you're right, so the next step in this process here will be to sand this epoxy primer before the application of the anti-fouling paint. Okay, excellent. Well, what we'll do next is we'll take a peek over at a boat that's recently had bottom paint on it. Unfortunately, I think it's a fiberglass boat that's got gel coat, but we'll see if we can find one that's got a shine on top of the water line as well. <laughs> we'll see if we All can right. find that, Thanks. sure. Well, Jim, it looks like we have found a boat that has a real nice top coat on it and a fresh bottom as well. So it looks like this one, heck, we're just about ready to pull the tape and throw it in the water, right? It sure does, Paul, and you're right, the boat looks really good. I mean, it looks like a fantastic anti-fouling uh, application here. Obviously, the top coats look in really good shape. So, I mean, if I'm the owner of this vessel, I would be really happy to call it my boat. I'm ready to go, that's yep. exactly right. Yep. So, you said we got a fresh coat of anti-fouling, anti fresh coat of bottom paint. They're all the same, right? What's the difference? Well, again, a uh, bit of a misnomer that they're all the same. Um, there are inherent differences in anti-fouling paints. The primary difference is the type of paint. You can have okay. a hard finish paint, right. or you can have what we call like a sloughing type of paint. An ablative to, paint. An ablative, to better describe okay. that, think of a bar of soap. Right. Every time you wash it, a little bit of the soap comes off that bar of soap. Gotcha. That's what ablatives uh, 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 mimic, if you will. Okay. And the reason for that is the ablatives, what they want to do is, while you're underway, anything that may have attached that anti-fouling paint will ablate or slough off the finish okay. while you're underway, exposing new biocide. Biocide is the word uh, that describes 
uh, what type of, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, a pesticide that is used in the anti-fouling paint. That's why they're so restricted because they are pesticides. So they just use copper, right? Well, copper is certainly one of them. Right. There are different types of copper, copper thiocyanate, uh, straight up copper, uh, cuprous oxide. So there's different variants of copper also. Well, if you step back a couple of hundred years, they used to use sheet copper, Copper right? sheeting, exactly. They used to right. just go clad right. the bottom of the boat in right. copper because it was the, the element that they had that had the best repelling properties for bottom growth. That's correct. Obviously, so we're still we using copper anymore. today. There are some other, uh, there are some other biocides that are used today, and there are some, uh, 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 there are some that uh, uh, add to it. Uh, they're, they're like uh, separate ingredients from the biocide. Um, and what they do is they help boost the, uh, the existing biocide in there uh, for the prevention of things like slime around the waterline, uh, which can always be troubling uh, because of the way the sun affects the, uh, uh, the anti-fouling paint right at the waterline. Right. So th those ingredients help to uh, combat uh, slime from growing around there. The actual biocide is still doing the work under the water line with regards to hard shell finish, barnacles, mussels, whatever it may be, uh, and other uh, other types of uh, uh, underwater type growth. or algae. Yep. 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 Exactly. So, so dumping a bunch of cayenne pepper isn't in there isn't effective like we thought it was years ago. Well, I think ago. We're, I think we're giving away a little bit of our age now because <laughs> that's that's been a uh, I think that's been a bit of a wives' tale for an awful long time. Of course, right. you will encounter people that swear by it, and right. you will run into lab rats who say. You're throwing your money away. Well, and but you know there were actually, there were some uh, uh, anti-fouling companies that offered it as an additive. Right. And it was cayenne pepper. Well, so. and you know what? Different places where you keep your boat have different challenges. You've got saltier or, or uh, lower, lower salinity yeah. waters. Yeah. You've got water flow, which is right. a huge consideration. Right. Right. You know, we were talking a little while ago about my roots in the brokerage business were up in Jacksonville. Right. And the Ortega River yeah. is about seven feet deep. The water is dark brown right. because of all the tannins. tannins. And in the summertime, the water is 92, 93 degrees. Yeah. So it, and it's full of Scott's Turf Builder Plus from all <laughs> the neighbors with the water running off of their lawns. It, it's a perfect soup to grow it, it uh, really uh, is. Uh, 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 grass or, or barnacles or wherever it may be. So uh, you're right about that. And that's something I would encourage every uh, uh, captain or uh, applicator to have a discussion first if you're choosing a, a, an anti-fouling paint for the first time. Where do you primarily keep the vessel? How often do you use the vessel? Do you incorporate or, or use divers to go down and uh, uh, have a look at the bottom and do a little bit of scrubbing once a month or whatever it may be? Those are really important questions that should be asked before any anti-fouling paint is on. What's the substrate? Is it aluminum? Is it steel? Right. Is it wood? Is it composite? Is it fiberglass? Right. All those questions need to be asked first. Now, once you establish that, you find an anti-fouling paint that works for where you keep the boat, how often you use the boat, and the type of substrate, it, it's really recommended that you don't veer from that or change from that, because that's what's working. So yeah. you, 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 may, you may encounter something that uh, uh, is being introduced as new and improved or whatever it may be, and it may work very well for you, may not. And that all has to do with not the paint itself, but the environment where the vessel is kept and how often the vessel is kept and what kind of maintenance is done on the vessel. And we go all back important. to prep again as exactly. well. Exactly. Because yeah. you could put an ablative paint over an epoxy paint, but you can't go the other way around. Yeah, you got to be careful. Yeah. And you still right. don't do just a straight application. Yeah, because if you put that over your ablative paint, then everything comes right off. Exactly. And what's the captain's question? Sloughing Where's epoxy. my paint? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Sloughing epoxy. Exactly. Yeah. So um, t let's talk just briefly about, we talk about applications and what the substrate is and where we are with regard to the paint choices we make. But, you know, with so many boats today being kept out of the water, is an epoxy boxy paint satisfactory for a boat that's kept up on a rack? Or is that where we can only use an ablative type of paint? Well, or they got hybrid types of paints now? No, it's a really good question you ask. And actually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm unfamiliar if there really are any true anti-fouling epoxies. There are anti, there are, pardon me, underwater epoxy coatings but they really don't have anti-fouling properties. So you'll find a lot of those used in uh, um, sailboats where uh, uh, maybe they do a lot of racing. Right. They want to be able to burnish the finish or wet sand it and make it nice and smooth. So a lot of them will choose an, an epoxy coating that's suitable for underwater, but it's not an anti-fouling. Okay. Generally, epoxies uh, don't hold up well when uh, uh, they're exposed to UV. Right. Uh, so they would be a for lack of a better way, I would say they'd be a poor choice. Okay. I would certainly uh, advise anybody considering anti-fouling uh, 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 choices to stick with um, 
either a, either a hard finish or an ablative finish. Those so, are your two best choices. So a boat that's going to be uh, kept on a rack in a dry stack or kept on a lift behind a home. And I mean, today, yeah, oh, it's a 53 footer. It's got four outboard engines on it and it lives on a lift. Yeah. We're living in a little bit of a different world. Yes. Now it used to be where a 53 foot sport fishing boat, for example, or a motor yacht that was getting used a lot, we'd use a hard paint. But now, with the boats being kept out of the water for a couple of weeks at a time, if I'm not mistaken, when you take a hard paint out of the water, it can lose its efficacy. Am I not correct? No, you're absolutely spot on with that. And the reason okay. for that is, um, is the, uh, the, the copper being exposed to fresh air. Uh -huh. It can actually degrade. Okay. And then you lose the potency of the copper, in the, whether it's copper thiocyanate, cupress oxide, you lose the effectiveness of it because it's degrading from being exposed to fresh air. Now, okay. that doesn't mean uh, uh, you and I couldn't put a hard finish on the bottom of our vessel and uh, we, um, we put it on a trailer to move it to a maintenance shop, have something done, and then put it back in the water tomorrow the following day. That's fine. Right. But uh, an extended period of uh, being out of the water, I would strongly suggest they don't consider a hard finish. Right. They'd look at an ablated finish. Gotcha. It sounds like that's the proper choice. I think so. Jim, I think uh, I think we've covered paints, uh, excuse the pun, but top to bottom. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the, the differences in the, the chemical compounds or the chemical compositions of the paints yeah. for their shine, uh, their their uh, their luster, their ability to be repaired yeah. um, or uh, in bottom paints, the different applications, the different environments. Uh, the different uses. I think we've got a pretty good overview of what goes on with paint. Asco Noble covers everything from top to bottom. They cover uh, ablatives and, and hard finishes with the Interlux lines, and they cover all the glosses through the All Grip and a family, All Grip family of right. products as well. When, I, when I'm speaking to a captain and he's in the process of making a decision, you know, which top coat or which anti fouling to use, I always make him uh, uh, answer me a, a question, and that is, you know, uh, do you just keep the boat right here where we are? No, we travel all over the place. I'm like, fine, if you travel all over the place, don't you want a company that is also present in the areas where you go? Well, that makes so sense. So whether it's Axel Nobel or, you know, Remember. another paint company, you should be uh, you should be familiar with the fact that they have representation in other areas where you may go. Uh, the anti-fouling that you choose here in the South Florida area will work in the med. Right. You know, you've got to you got to consider that also. So there's a lot of things that uh, go into making that decision. But I always encourage captains to think about it and don't just throw an anti-fouling paint on there for the sake of throwing an anti-fouling paint on there. Sure. It's akin to throwing your money away. Well, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Jim, that's been really informative. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We're going to go back over to you, Heather, in the tent, and we're going to continue on with our day. Wait a second. We're not done yet. There's more to talk about. This isn't a one and done. Jim, we put all this beautiful top coat on the boat. We make it shine beautifully. We don't just drive off into the sunset and forget about it. What do we do after the fact? How do we maintain a beautiful yeah, surface that's a really, like that? That's a really good question to ask. Uh, care and maintenance is paramount to your finish lasting a long time. Nobody wants to spend money to paint the boat again in a year or two. Of course. You know, so. They want to get multiple years out of the finish, right. uh, have the boat looking good. So it's actually a, a rather simple approach to keeping paint looking good. We, uh, we always recommend uh, uh, fresh water washdowns, chamois the finish off. When you have to, use a mild soap. Um, are there any kind of particular soaps that you don't want to use that people are inclined to use? Yeah, that's a really good question also. Detergents. We, yeah, detergents, um, uh, dishwashing soaps. Uh, they contain a product called, or an ingredient called surfactants. Right. Surfactants are grease cutting agents. Okay. If you use it on the boat once in five years, probably Not has no deal. detrimental effect. But if that was your regular maintenance product, uh, a, 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 a grease cutting uh, uh, type of soap, you'd probably uh, cause the paint to lose its gloss over a, a period so of time. So it'll actually degrade that yeah, hard surface yeah. a little bit. It'll take it down, exactly. Okay. So right. fresh water wash down, mild soap, right? Uh, chamois to finish off, right. uh, always rinse before you wash. Spots. Yep, exactly. Uh, if you get a little bit of uh, salt stains on there, which is possible, these vessels are always sure. underway somewhere. Um, you can use a little bit of a, uh, a mixture of uh, hot water and white vinegar, right? but maintain uh, copious amounts of uh, fresh water nearby because right. vinegar is acidic yeah, and you don't want to leave an acid-based acid uh, uh, cleaner but on the paint. Keep, it'll keep etching. So again, wash regular, fresh water, mild soap. We do make soap and we do make a, a, a polymer sealant. Okay. Uh, we don't make them because we want to just sell soap and polymer sealants. We really All put right. a lot of 
research into what works on paint, what doesn't work on paint. So let's talk about what a polymer sealant does. Sure. You know, as, as hard as that surface is, and to the naked eye, it's like glass. Yeah. But it actually is porous to a degree, isn't That's it? correct. Right. So if you were to magnify the finish and look at it, right. you would notice there's porosity in the finish. Right. So what the polymer sealant's mission in life is, you wipe it on, uh, it will fill in the porosity. Right. It dries, you wipe it back off. Don't use a machine because you can create swirl marks with polymer sealants. Right. Uh, use um, uh, Microsoft uh, towels or Microfiber. diapers or something, right, terry cloth. And uh, when you wipe it off, you leave behind some of the polymer sealant in the porosity. Of course. Well, what that does now is that prevents dirt from settling into the porosity. When dirt settles into the porosity or the pores of the finish, it makes your paint start to look dull and old and tired before it does. Sure. So it's really, it's really in your best interest to use a polymer sealant. you don't have to get that detergent out to clean it all Well, out exactly. But, but the nice thing about a polymer sealant, uh, they're not a wax, they're not a Teflon uh, or anything, a ceramic or anything like that. They're designed to be long lasting and you don't have to compound them off the boat. They will naturally wear away, okay. but they will give you months and months and months of protection. So if a captain asks me, I generally tell him, um, you should have the crew look after applying a coat of a polymer sealant three times a year. Okay. If you have areas on the vessel where you uh, experience hard water runoff, calcium runoff from uh, through hulls, things like that, maybe look after that a little bit more. Maybe instead of three times a year, maybe six times a year, look after those areas. And our flatter surfaces that are exposed more to direct sunlight. Exactly, right, they right. tend to burn off yeah, of there more quickly. That's really good. A lot, of, a lot of times I encounter issues on the vessel where the captain's asking me what it is, I know, but I want to do my due diligence. And it's generally water spotting. Uh -huh. And the funny thing about water and sun, they, they, when they're magnified, they become like almost not an acid, but they can etch themselves into the finish. Sure. And once they do, it's, it's next to impossible to get it out. Well, Even compounding and buffing doesn't remove it. It leaves some telltale of that water stain there. So it's important to always shammy the boat off, get the crew working on that every day. Wet surfaces, horizontal ones, shammy them off. Don't let the sun beat on that water all and day. The, and the light colors obviously reflect that sunlight better than the dark colors. Correct. The dark, dark colors are even more adversely affected. They pull affect. it in. Absolutely, right. because yeah. of the heat generated. Also, and a lot of crew know this already, um, uh, main deck, uh, boat decks, things like that. Wherever you have cushions, if you're not underway, Put stow the cushions, them, because any water trapped under there can lead to the same condition, including blistering. That's why we don't uh, like to see polyurethanes below the waterline, right. because they can blister from a, a water exposure, prolonged water exposure. Sure, Yeah. sure. Well, now I think we've got it wrapped up. I think we've got a good handle on preps, on adhesions, on primers, on top coats, on yeah. bottom coats. And now yeah. I think it's okay to go over to you, Heather, in the tent. I'll see you there in a few minutes. Yacht Engineering Week 2021 has been made possible by Pantropic Power, the only authorized Caterpillar Power Systems dealer in South Florida. Florida Nautical Surveyors, your complete solution to all of your vessel surveying needs. And Robert Allen Law, exclusively dealing with the business of yachting. We would also like to thank Quantum Stabilizers, AME Solutions, D'Angelo Exhaust, MPI Marine Professionals Incorporated, Concord Marine Electronics, Lauderdale Marine Center, Marine Data, Isotropic, Dockmate, and Murray Ventilation Products. We'll be right back. Hello, welcome to Caterpillar Miami Lakes Learning Center. I would like to talk to you about our new C32B high performance marine engine. The new engine is offered in three ratings, the 2000, the 2200, and the 2400 brake horsepower, all rated at 2300 RPM. The core of this engine has been completely upgraded for increased power density capability. We have increased the compression height on the pistons. The connecting rods also been redesigned for more power capability. Of course, the crankshaft has increased in size and strength. And we've also changed the main bearing size. 
We've upgraded the cylinder block to accommodate the change and also the cylinder heads have been optimized with the improved water jacket and integrated fuel lines. The fuel system has been updated with an enhanced unit injection fuel system. With the split shot capability enables us to make sound reductions at trolling and low engine speeds. The fuel filtration system has been upgraded for optimal performance. The charge air system has been upgraded to a three turbo sequential air system. We can control the sequence of how the turbos are utilized as the engine speed and power increase. The cooling system update includes a larger after cooler core and a second rubber impeller seawater pump. So now there's a seawater pump on the front and the rear of the engine, a dedicated circuit for the after cooler and a dedicated circuit for the jacket water heat exchanger. However, we maintain a single inlet and outlet seawater connection. The seawater system is electrically bonded, so there is no longer zinc anodes to replace. For electronics, we've upgraded to the latest CAT ECM technology, the Atom 6, with faster and larger processor. We will offer duplex fuel and oil filtration, marine alarm and protection system, and dual ECMs to meet MCS requirements when requested. Also available, optional electric fuel priming pump, a 500-hour oil pan to complement the standard 250-hour offer. Engine will be certified for EPA Tier 3 recreational, IMO2 and IMO3 switchable. It will also come with an integrated SCR system certified at the factory. We're excited to add a new chapter to the C32 Legacy and bring this new C32B high performance engine to the market. And we're back. Our next segment is with Melissa and Mike from Isotropic. We learned a good bit about connectivity, Heather. We sure did. Let's share with our viewers what we learned. Lee, play the tape. Welcome back, everybody. We're here to talk about satellite connectivity in this segment. Uh, I want to thank the folks from Seakeeper and Kristen Klein at Northrop & Johnson for getting us access to the yacht Sinbad, where we're here with Melissa Orlick, our co-host Heather, and Mike Moser from Isotropic they're going to give us a little insight as to what goes on in the satellite world today and subscription services so that we can set some realistic expectations. Welcome, Melissa. Thanks so much. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Paul. I'm not going to welcome Heather because she's been with us all day. <laughs> so, Melissa, here's the situation. Um, unless you've been living in a cave, you're pretty much aware of the fact that the boating business is on fire. Um, and the thing that we've realized over the course of the last 12 months is a huge influx in first-time boat buyers. Now, with the onset of the pandemic, people vacated their offices and they went and activated home offices. And the first thing that they realized was that they didn't have the bandwidth in their home system to be able to support all of the things that they needed to use. So they had the kids home from school and they were streaming, whether it was classes or video games is irrelevant. Um, Mom had the things that she was nor normally used to doing and having access to during the day at home. And then here comes dad, if that happens to be the structure of the household, here comes dad operating his business from home or having to have connectivity through his office with Zoom calls and things of that nature. Uh, we learned early in the game at IYBA that people thought they had incredible bandwidth and Wi-Fi systems at home and they could support anything they needed to do and we'd invite a panelist to a webinar and it would be choppy and it would crash. So they've gotten all of that squared away at home. They've made their systems more robust and then they got cabin fever and they decided we got to get out of the house or we're all going to go crazy. So fortunately, a lot of them have come to realize that boating is a great escape and if they can afford it, they can spend extended periods of time on the boat and they want to be able to still operate like they do at home. 
So let's set some realistic expectations for the brokerage community because they're the first point of contact with all these people and the ones that are answering the questions. What do we need to tell these first time buyers with regard to connectivity so that they can have what it is that they need and understand that there's a cost involved, but they can tailor that cost to their comfort level. Yeah, you're exactly right. We've seen a tremendous amount of you know, first time boat owners, first time users of VSET services or cellular services on board yachts. So setting expectations is definitely has to be the first job right off the bat. Um, I think, you know, first of all, you know, if you have a VSAT system on board, you'll want to do a sur side survey of it, find out what equipment you have on board and what capabilities that equipment can do. Can it travel to the places that you want to go to? Can it provide you the speeds that you need to? If you don't have equipment, you need to work with either your marine electronics dealer or a technician service and find out what you can install on board based on the size of the yacht, based on where you're going to go, and possibly the capabilities, again, of what you really want to stream. I want to step back real quickly to one of the first things that you said in where you're going to go. So many of these services, as I remember from years ago, were tailored to small geographic areas. Is that still the case? Do you have to pretty much define where you're going to be operating the boat or can you have wide ranging connectivity? Well, especially I think with COVID and so forth, I think people are trying to get as far away as they can, obviously, <laughs> from, from shore based side. So everything from down to the Caribbean, South America, Panama, Costa Rica, a lot of people are going everywhere these days. So you want to be able to have a system and have a provider that can provide you either with the coverage of the regions you want to go to or specific locations. So you definitely want to ask those questions on both ends, equipment wise and a service provider side. Okay. So when we've identified the equipment that we're going to need to get the reach that we'll want for the area that we're going to be traveling and we've determined the subscription, what is it that we can, let's just, let's use as an example, um, a 70 foot boat that's going to travel the southeastern United States and the Bahamas. So let's just use that as an easy template to work from because it's a big piece of what we do. What would we be telling that first time buyer he's going to need for that and what would his expectations be in his ability to stay connected? Let's say he has a wife and two children that are going to be on board the boat with him traveling and let's have a captain so that he doesn't run aground. <laughs> and have to use his VSAT to call for exactly. help. Exactly. Okay. Yep. I think the biggest thing, and I think even in just yachting alone, the more educated you are on what you really need is key. So be educated on what you think you're going to be using for applications. Is your wife going to be shopping and possibly shopping for another house? Are you <laughs> going to be uh, trying to use your office and using Zoom calls? And are your kids doing remote learning or are they just on board trying to do their video gaming? what are all those applications and what do those applications actually require for speed? Because as we know, each one of those requires different speeds. So you're going to want to make sure that your package allows for all of you as a users to be able to have that. Okay. That brings up a question that, that I just thought of. I know with my cellular data plan, they have this thing called unlimited, which we all know there's no real such thing as unlimited. Is there something like that with these kinds of systems as well? Like an unlimited plan or yeah, about so that. unlimited has been such an ambiguous term that's been thrown around. And I think a lot of people think that that's what they need to ask for, which in reality, a number of cellular carriers, a number of VSAT service providers have actually redefined that term to really just mean no overage charges. So at the end of the day, you want to dig deeper and find out what the service providers are actually offering for you. Are they offering you month to month contracts? Are they offering you three month contracts? what are those actual terms and what's the flexibility of it? Because maybe they want to go from one location to another and then they need to go home to visit other family. Do they need to have services during those off periods is really the questions you should be asking. Sure, so I guess you need to figure out what is it that you're doing? Are you Zooming? Are you just searching the internet? Are you streaming Netflix? So is that, I guess, a bandwidth question maybe? Or do you ask the, the client, you know, what, what do you typically do when you're using your internet? Are you on Zoom for client meetings? I know that's what I would personally be doing, but you know, my little cousin might want to be streaming his video games. So what, what are the differences there and what, um, what kind of accommodations can you make for different clients? Certainly. I can touch on that. So, I mean, before we get to that, I think you should understand what uh, bandwidth packages, uh, how they're structured. And that typically comes with an MIR and a CIR. Your MIR is your maximum information rate. 
And what that means is that's your, your burstable speed. That's the highest speed that you can achieve on that bandwidth package. Um, your CIR is your committed information rate. Those are the minimum speeds that your, your package will allow. I'm sorry, excuse me, your, your minimum speeds that you can achieve on that bandwidth package, uh, regardless of network congestion um, or contention on the actual network, because uh, that comes into play a lot too. And if there's contention on the network, um, you know, your CIR is really going to be important because those are, those are the minimum speeds you're going to be achieving. And with that said, uh, going back to some of the requirements and streaming and things of that nature and video conferencing, um, understanding the, the requirements that each one of those platforms or those applications uh, require will help you choose your MIR and CIR accordingly. Uh, for example, uh, Netflix requires uh, two megabytes download speed uh, committed for standard definition TV. If you want to get into an HD connection, you're going to want to be closer to a five meg connection. Um, and from there, you know, going into video conferencing, that, that's a whole different animal. Uh, Netflix is very download intensive. With video conferencing, you're sending video packets off the boat just as much as you're receiving them to the boat. So that actually puts a strain on the upload side of things, making the upload and the download equally important. So those are some things you want to consider uh, when looking at bandwidth packages and uh, looking to stream. And uh, one other thing I'd like to touch on is the amount of devices. Uh, if you're streaming from one smart TV, we'll say, uh, you know, that wants HD connection, it's going to be a five meg package. If you're looking to do the same thing on maybe uh, a gaming PC or another TV on board or maybe a tablet or something, you have to take in that, that into consideration. If you have four devices that you're gonna be streaming Netflix from, you're gonna to wanna to multiply those requirements by four to make sure that you have the bandwidth there. If, if you don't do those things, you're gonna have a lackluster experience. There's gonna be buffering, the spinning wheel that we're probably familiar with. And um, you know, having all that, the, that full the picture. I remember spinning hourglass. <laughs> yes, yes. So you know, that brings a question to me, Mike, and that is we're accustomed uh, in a home environment or an office environment to the ability to do to go on to speed test Google speed test and you can download a speed test does this is this what you're talking about with regard to your MIRs and your CIRs can you do a speed test or is that something that is already determined in the package and you should expect that level of performance I would always recommend a speed test it, it, I mean we do it at home we should be doing it on our boats as well um, you know, at any given time, there can be uh, congestion on a network and everything. So checking your speeds frequently will allow you to understand, um, you know, is there congestion on the network? Do I need to make a phone call or am I really reaching the speeds? And knowing that you're, you're getting what you're paying for is, is critical. Um, and going back to those bandwidth requirements as well, running a speed test and you find that, you know, I'm getting 20 megabytes a second. That's great. Maybe you only need five megabytes, up, you know, per second for uh, your what you're looking to do with the network on board, that given charter or you know owner's trip or whatever it may be. So understanding the requirements of not only the personnel on board, uh, but the amount of devices and the actual requirements of the applications is critical to a good overall experience. When you're talking about congestion on the network, are you talking about congestion on your localized network or are you talking about congestion on the feed to your equipment on your boat? So are we talking about just the fact that I've got four uh, iPads playing on my boat or that I'm getting a limited amount of signal in and out to my boat? Well, it can actually be both, really. Um, there can be congestion from your, your service provider. And those are phone calls that, you know, uh, if you determine that you are having a lackluster experience, make a phone call to see what's going on. Maybe there's a better satellite for your area. Um, some, there's a lot of variables that are in play when it comes to satellite communications. Um, where you're located within the satellite footprint, um, the equipment that you have on board, um, how you're using the bandwidth. And it goes back to, um, like you said, the uh, being on board, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but I, I thought of a question. You were speaking of having multiple devices on board. Let's say I have a very important video conference that I need to be on and my little cousin is playing his video games. Is there any way that you can set a priority level of who gets the more bandwidth or is there something like that that's available? Absolutely, certainly. And that, that, that's what we call data management. And okay. uh, they make uh, numerous different devices. At Isotropic, we use Data Dragon. And what Data Dragon does is it uses what we call flow command to, 
shape your traffic and prioritize applications based on the needs. So if you find that you're gonna be using Zoom for the video conference that day, um, you can actually prioritize the Zoom application to get the bandwidth before any other devices on board receive that bandwidth. So that would obviously come from the, the personnel on board uh, and where what they find would be the most highest priority. Uh, so that could be the, uh, a captain having reserved upload bandwidth uh, to send a large attachment email. Uh, maybe they need to send documents to their next port of call or their yacht manager. Um, those are all critical you know, uh, communications that need to get out off the boat. And if, you are, uh, if there's congestion on the actual internal network uh, where you're maxing out those speeds, there, you may not have bandwidth available to get those critical documents or emails off the boat. So understanding uh, the requirements and knowing your bandwidth package is, is really critical. So you call that data management. Is that something that's included in your services? Is that an additional service? Going back to setting realistic expectations for first time buyers, is that something that they should expect to add on or is that usually included? Uh, with our service, it's included. Um, with uh, other providers, it may be a, a, a charge, a per month charge. Um, and they may use different types of devices. Um, I, I mentioned flow command and the way we see uh, the networks is everything is a flow. Every device that's connected to a network is a flow. And where we coin the term flow command is commanding those flows to go making sure the bandwidth is delivered where it needed most and not being wasted on things that are maybe running in the background that aren't needed, whether it's a, a video caching service or something of that nature, just chewing up that critical bandwidth that you need. So being able to prioritize, uh, can you set that up out of the gate so that it's always one, one link, one person, one device that has the priority, and then you can set a priority two for another person or device, and a priority three for and, and on down through the chain. Correct. Yep. So you can you know separate your network so that the owner and the guests get the priority of things, and then your crew and so forth get secondary. So it's good to be king. It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Mike, one of the things that you just mentioned, and whichever one of you chooses to answer, this is fine. Um, you talked about geographic areas and them being defined. Is it, I, I'm going to guess that the satellites are in a geofixed orbit, correct? Certainly. So, so they're in a specific location and they are in sync with the orbit of the Earth. Is the, de, is the defined boundary on the satellite signal a very sharp defined boundary or do you just start to lose it? Do they overlap? How, how does it, if you choose to move around, how does that work? Uh, they, they do overlap in certain instances, certainly, and it is a gradual fall off as you're reaching the edge of the footprint. And as you're reaching the edge of the footprint, you're going to lose signal strength, which can affect your bandwidth speeds. Uh, so it, it is critical to have multiple satellite options especially um, in the area that you're traveling. Uh, you wanna have more than just one or two options, if possible, three or four. And that gives you different look angles. Like you had mentioned, the satellites are geostationary, so they are spinning with the same speed of the Earth. They're always fixated in a specific part of the sky. Uh, so with that said, you may be looking east to one specific satellite, and maybe there's a big mountainous area in your way that's blocking that line of sight that you need to be able to hit that satellite. Having different options allows you to have different look angles where maybe you're blocked to the east, you have an option to your west that can give you connectivity. And that's really critical and something you should look at when speaking with a, a satellite provider to ensure that you, you're getting multiple options when it comes to satellites. Okay, all right. So what we've been talking about so far has been predominantly focused on internet connectivity. What other connectivities should we be thinking about? Well, my first, my first thought is telephone type connectivity. We're all used to having cellular phones, as Heather had mentioned, the cellular package says it's unlimited. What are the different connectivities that we're really needing to focus on here other than internet? I think other ones that you should look at is obviously always safety systems, right? So okay. between you know a set CGM DSS, depending on what your flag state regulates you as for okay. your vessel, uh, I also think always having a handheld satellite 
sat phone is always great whether you're leaving the yacht and maybe going ashore the handheld radios aren't working for that distance you have some means of communication if your cell phone service isn't working i think for us those are some big ones uh, again depending on the size of your yacht you could look at having another backup system whether it's through an iridium or inmarsat network which just provides you a redundancy of communications okay so it gives you some backup yep. so what we're talking about in satellite uh, primarily is through connectivity of data, uh, yeah. but we also have the ability to piggyback voice on top of that. Right, so with all of our VSAT services, for example, and probably through many other service providers, you have voice over IP, so it's an internet voice line right. that you have through satellite. So you'll have those that go through the satellite network and go out. The okay. same way you would through the data. So different from the old days when we had to have dedicated ones, now we have VOIP, yep. which allows you to use a singular satellite, a subscription service that's going to provide you all those different uh, conveniences and connectivities. Exactly. So it would just be similar to a VOIP desk phone that you may see in your office or similar to an at-home office or so forth. You pick it up, you dial out just the same way that you would at your house. Okay. All right. So setting realistic expectations has been you know, the primary goal for what we're trying to do here and help people understand how to communicate with their client base, what their needs are. What is there anything else that we feel like would be important to convey to that first time owner? Is there a question that I haven't asked that you get frequently? I, I think for, you know, on our side, I think it's really, truly total cost of ownership, right? Right. We all know whether market you are in within yachting you know marketing is amazing and it can, can provide amazing information to you but what you really want to dig down deep is look at the fine print what all are you committing to are there any hidden fees you know make sure there's no strings attached i you know you don't want to walk out there and find out three months later oh i've got an additional 35 dollar or per month charge or hundred dollar charge or whatever it may be find out if there is anything that's below the surface I think those $35 charges are pretty absorbable. Yeah. I think it's those $3,500 charges exactly. that give people a little, that's an attention getter. Um, and, and, and to give a pricing it is, is very, very difficult to do. Yeah. But are we talking about ranges of hundreds of dollars for a monthly subscription of good connectivity where I could be running my life from my boat? Or are we talking about in the thousands of dollars range? For the VSAT service, you're going to be looking at thousands of dollars. And even on the cellular side, too, I mean, if you want solid enterprise data, you're still going to be looking at an expense there that's going to be over a few hundred dollars. So, again, that goes right back to the initial conversation, and that's realistic expectations. Yep. You know, it, it, it's very easy to say, well, heck, if they can afford the boat, they can afford this stuff. But the reality of it is we all live in the real world. And where we choose to make our expenditures and where we choose to spend our discretionary dollars is dictated by the overall cost. So we want to have happy experiences. If we want mom to not be shopping for a new house, but <laughs> maybe shopping for a new boat so she has more room and she has a good case of two footitis that we exactly. all hope they get, we want them to have realistic expectations of the overall experience because there's no worse surprise than looking back on your chart of accounts at the end of the year and saying, I spent how much yep. on that? Nobody ever told me that. Yep. So these pieces are really important to understand and understand clearly. It is, and yeah. true transparency. I think that's the biggest thing. If you have transparency from the service provider to you and you provide transparency back, whether that's the captain providing it or the broker, so that the both parties really know what's being requested, sets a great expectation. Everybody needs to be informed, yep. absolutely. Mike, is there anything else that you feel would be important for the audience to know about the technical aspects of it, the expectations that they can have, uh, the speeds on board that you could normally consider to be supported, supporting certain amounts of equipment, or you know, is it a normal thing to be able to run a couple, three or four devices at one time, or is that something you really have to be specific of in your site survey? Um, it's definitely important during the site survey, and you certainly can uh, use multiple devices on the VSAT system uh, simultaneously. That's not an issue. Um, it goes back to the data management side of things. If you're really paying attention to what you're doing on the network and ensuring all that bandwidth is being used wisely and going to the, the applications that have those priorities, um, you know, it can cut down on your total cost of ownership. Your, you're not needing to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on a bandwidth package 
uh, you maybe can go from needing eight megabytes to only needing six megabytes. And that could be a savings of thousands of dollars per month. And you know, cutting down on those requirements and everything is really just a data management type of, uh, of, of situation. It's not, not allowing things to go to waste and um, managing the network properly. And that comes from not only the satellite provider, but also the onboard network from a LAN and a WAN perspective. So that brings up an interesting question. Um, when I subscribe to my service, am I locked into that service for a period of time? Or is there ability for me to be flexible and say, you know what, I thought I was going to need a 12 megabyte packet and I'm really only using seven. Can I scale that down to an eight so I have a little extra? Or you know, conversely, if I've subscribed to an eight and I, my business takes off and I'm doing a lot of Zooms and I yeah. need more bandwidth, can I, can I get with the provider and modify that program? So that's what you definitely need to speak right off the bat with your provider. What am I committed to? Okay. Some companies are very flexible. Some companies have more restrictions. Uh, you might be only able to upgrade for a month with one company. You might be able to upgrade per day with another company, okay. which again, that goes back to your total cost of ownership. Are you using bandwidth when you need it? Well, and there's a, there's a particularly uh, uh, pertinent application that comes to mind, and that is a boat that's privately owned, but maybe goes into the charter season for a period of time. Let's just say it's a, a privately owned boat and the guy uses it with his family, but then it goes into charter for eight weeks commitment in the Caribbean during the winter. So his demands are gonna be significantly higher and he has to be able to monitor what that cost is so he can factor it into his charter costs. Yep, we see that very frequently. A lot okay. of privately owned yachts, but they do have a certain amount of weeks out of the year that they do wanna allow for charter for whatever reason it may be. And you know there is the flexibility where it's, you know the owner only needs X amount of data, but they know that this charter coming on is very, very kid friendly, a lot of activity. Right. They don't want to be playing outside. They want to be gaming or whatever we need to be. Need to be. They're able to upgrade just One for that charter week. One of the charter charter guests week. is going to be shopping for a boat. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that boat that they're on. You got to be able to go to yachtbroker.org, the <laughs> IYBA multiple listing system, and find your new boat. Exactly. Shameless plug. And we should also know what the MLS requires for bandwidth. <laughs> That's right. It's elegant, it's minimal, and it's intuitive. <laughs> exactly. So you do want to be able to have that flexibility so that you know the charter guest is only paying for the bandwidth when they're on board because you don't want to have to put that cost over to a you know a charter and say oh well you have to pay for the whole month at an upgraded rate no you should only pay for it for the period that you're on board and really you don't want to be. set your charter rate to where you lose money exactly because it's about it's a business certainly it's a business right. this has really been enlightening and i think one of the most important things that we can do in the brokerage community is to assist the brokers through our educational components in learning all the technical aspects that they can possibly absorb, and again, setting realistic ex expectations. Yep. Because bringing people in is super important. For years and years and years, we've been looking for ways to get people engaged in the yachting industry. Now our quest is to keep them engaged. Melissa, Mike, thanks so much. Heather, are there any other questions that you need or are you pretty well informed? I'm pretty well informed, Paul. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining us on this segment. We're gonna go to a break and we'll be back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Allen, and I work with a law firm known as Robert Allen Law. We're a law firm dedicated to serving the needs of people in the yacht industry. And that means manufacturers, that means brokers, that means buyers, that means sellers, that means banks, that means people who sell all sorts of things and services to the yacht industry. We're a team of lawyers that has experience in virtually all the fields surrounding this business. And if you're in the business, you know how important it is to work with lawyers who know yachts, right? And know the type of problems that arise and know how to solve them. Our job as lawyers is to help deals get done. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, be of service to the industry. And we look forward to hearing from you if the need arises. Michael here, founder of Concord Marine Electronics. I've got a lot of customers that ask us how it is we've been in business for over 32 years. And you can take a look at our glowing Google and Facebook reviews for yourself, but our customers tell me they come back because our proposals are so accurate and our service department is second to none. And on top of that, we've got the technical depth to handle any problems that might come along. We're proud to announce that we've just opened a new location at Lauderdale Marine Center where we're closer to our customers for better service. 
So when you or your customers are ready for electronic systems completed on time and on budget, call the experts at Concord Marine Electronics. DockMate is a small, handheld, wireless remote control for boat operators. It wirelessly controls the boat's engine, thrusters, anchor, and horn to eliminate those difficult docking situations and give boat owners a better boating experience. Our two-way communication between our remote and our receiver provides the redundant safety features owners are looking for. DockMate is the only wireless remote control that can provide you with smooth, variable, proportional throttle control. Our proprietary customizable software called Dock Control allows us to personalize the DockMate twist exactly to the owner's specifications. Give yourself a better boating experience and install a DockMate today on your vessel. D'Angelo Marine Exhaust was founded in a small shop in Fort Lauderdale in 1986. Today, we occupy over 30,000 square feet of state-of-the-art manufacturing and engineering facilities. We produce, service, and repair marine exhaust systems and diesel particulate filter systems. For more information, go to d'angelomarine.com. Marine Data Solutions. Our affordable, high-speed internet keeps you connected. Marine Data Solutions is proud to provide superior wireless internet for yachting, 10 times faster than your VSAT at a fraction of the cost. Our unlimited internet service includes no throttle, no contract, no activation fee, no overages, no surprises, and same day shipping with 24 7 tech support. Check out our Bahamas Airtime package 300 gigabytes for $350, no throttle. And we offer unlimited gigabytes of unthrottled, high-speed mobile internet service throughout the continental United States. A fixed low monthly cost and no long-term commitment. Call us today to find out more about the best high-speed marine wireless internet. We ship SIMs and equipment anywhere in the world overnight. We are Marine Data Solutions. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for that conversation with uh, Melissa and Mike. Uh, Heather, I think you were over learning about how to put fires out. I sure was. Lee, play the tape. Hi, everyone. I'm here at Fire Ranger in Fort Lauderdale, where Paul has sent me to dispel some myths about the fire extinguisher systems and safety systems on boats. Paul will be texting me some questions for the guys, so let's go meet him now. Hello, Barbara. Good, how are you? Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Heather. Hey, good nice afternoon, Nice to Heather. meet you, Glenn. Nice to meet you. 
Neil, nice you. to meet you. Paul said you were coming by. Welcome. Yes, Paul has been sending me some questions via text message that brokers have and some misconceptions in the industry. So I'd love to take a look at your facility and hear what you have to say with your combined 40 years of expertise. <laughs> okay, I'll show you around. No worries. Let's go. Let's do a, let's do a tour. Okay, I will follow oh, this you. Way. This, this way? This way? Okay. You passed reception already, you met Barbara? Yes, very nice. Perfect. Okay, let's see what questions Paul is sending us here. So our first question is, tell us about the different types of portable fire extinguishers and extinguishing agents. Okay, portable fire extinguishers are designed, as they say, to extinguish fires. So they're the first line of defense and they come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors. There is no set color, they can be any color. Red is the industry standard. And that's the ones that are the most commonly manufactured, but they can be in white, as you see, silver, all different colors. The most common types of fire extinguishers that are out there are what are called dry chemical fire extinguishers. They have ABC powder inside them. These are used for multi-purpose effect to cover the most common types of fire, which is trash wood and paper, liquids, oils and gasolines, and electric fires. There are other agents like water, halon gases, CO2, foam, that are designed for specific types of fires and specific applications. So the most common fire extinguishers you find are ABC dry chemical. And does ABC stand for something? It stands for the most common types of fires that you have. Each fire is rated. Type A is trash wood and paper. Okay. Type B is liquids and gas. And type C is electrical. So if it's an ABC extinguisher, it covers the most common types of fires. Obviously, it wouldn't be a good idea to put water onto electrics or, wouldn't, or on, onto gasolines. So you have extinguishing agents, the most commonly dry chemical, they're designed to cover any type of fire. So an ABC extinguisher is the most common type you will find. Wonderful. Here at Fire Ranger, we service, maintain, and inspect the fire extinguishers. This is our inventory and storage area. These extinguishers here have all been tested, um, ready to go out into the field. So if we have to swap out equipment that's been used or discharged or damaged, we have extinguishers here on the shelves that the techs can take straight out into the environment. Great, so these ones are all ready to go? These are all ready to go, yes. We Wonderful. have many more that I can show you in a minute that are going to be serviced, but these ones have been checked, passed through our quality control testing, and are here sat on the shelves ready to stock the trucks. Okay, let's take a look at the ones that need service. Okay, come on through. This is our um, packaging and inventory area. Any equipment that is supplied to the vessel, fire and safety services, is set up here. And when the techs pull up in their vehicles, they come to the back here, they call in their order, and our warehouse department gets it ready for them. Fantastic. When the technicians work out in the field, they bring back equipment that needs to be serviced or maintained for some reason. They bring it here, they drop it off. Either it has to be scrapped because there's something wrong with it, or it can be reserviced, refilled and recharged. Basically a fire extinguisher has a shelf life, a born on day. Depending on the type of fire extinguisher, it could be either five years, six years, 10 or 12. The most common types of fire extinguishers have to be refilled every six years and then hydro tested, which is a pressure test taken uh, out on them every 12 years. So depending on the type of extinguisher, it gets dropped off here by the technicians. Our warehouse staff take the extinguisher. They either scrap it, in which case we recycle the metal and the powder or the agent inside them, or they can rebuild them. Around here, we have what's called our recharge room. All the fire extinguishers are sorted into type and size. Just turn the fan off there, please. Here in our recharge room, our technicians take the fire extinguishers, they disassemble them, they take out the agent, they rebuild the heads, they put in new O-rings and valves, they repressurize the fire extinguishers, they then put them into a water bucket, they pressure test them, make sure there's no leaks in them, they then clean them up, put the new certification stickers on them, put the hose back on, and then they're ready to go back out into service again. Wow. So an average fire extinguisher would have a lifespan of 12 years, and every six years it has to be refilled. Every 12 years it has to have a complete hydro test on them. These ones here have passed through the inspection test, the refill test, they've been repressurized, and now the reason they're in the water is making sure there's no leaks or bubbles coming out, and if they're good to go, they get cleaned up and put back into the, into the, uh, into the system, ready to be used again. So how many times can you refurbish uh, one as long as it's not too damaged or it's not rusty or it's not got too much corrosion on it, you can keep going. You can't have anything that's prior to 1984. Okay. But any fire extinguisher that is allowed to be recharged and refilled, it was manufactured after 1984, 
As long as extinguishers is in good condition, we can keep recycling it every six to 12 years and, uh, and refilling it, taking it apart, uh, replacing components inside and giving it a new life. Wonderful. Okay. Once the fire extinguisher is good and ready to go, it's then um, put in a pallet, depending again on type and size, taken back over to our inventory department, and the techs will then take it out into the field. It looks we good also, Thank you. We also <laughs> service, they, they, that's the idea, yeah. Making them clean and shiny is, 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 a really, uh, is a really important part of the job. We also inspect and certify and test fire suppression systems. These are fire suppression cylinders that have come off of many different types of vessels. As you can see, again, they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. There's CO2, there's clean agent, there's foam. Um, this equipment here is specific equipment that's come off a certain vessel, and that vessel is requiring the exact same equipment back. Quite often, what you get is a swap out process where if a technician goes on site and fires an extinguisher that has an issue with it, he will then just swap it out for one that is good to go. But in, in a lot of occasions, the owners of a vessel or the management or the captains only want the same equipment back, in which case it is documented that way. So when this equipment has been serviced and refilled, that equipment goes back onto the exact vessel. Okay, I see these ones have labels. So that's probably why they want the same this ones is a, back. Yeah. Every fire extinguisher has a place on the ship. You can't just randomly put them around. So right. depending on the fire plan of the ship, each fire extinguisher is designated for that area. You have certain extinguishers that can be in the kitchens or the engine rooms or the galleys. Um, and certain, this one here is on the sun, goes on the sun deck. This one here goes in the laundry room, so we know exactly where it gets replaced when it gets put back. Fantastic. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so what else do we do at Fire Ranger here? We service and repair all the fire suppression systems and portable fire extinguishers ourselves. We cover many different services. Um, we have to recycle a lot of equipment. Um, a lot of um, fire extinguishers that come back into play um, uh, uh, can be scrapped, but we can't just throw them into the trash. They have to be depressurized. The same with batteries. We can't just throw these away. So these have to be all um, packaged up correctly, boxed up, and sent back for recycling. I see. The, uh, the hydro testing that Neil was discussing earlier, right here, we have, we have hydro testing equipment. So the cylinders get hydrostatically tested here as part of the uh, inspection process. Hydro testing is, is, a, is a pressure test that's completed on the cylinder. It can be done one of two ways. In this scenario here, a cylinder is filled with water. It's put into this water jacket. We then pump it full of pressure and the cylinder expands. If the cylinder expands and does not break or does not crack, it will then contract again. We then dry it out, clean it up, and you can reuse that cylinder. There are two types of uh, cylinders that we can hydro test. This is our high pressure um, machine, which does uh, extinguishes up to 3000 PSI. And this is our low pressure machine, which does extinguishes up to 900 PSI. Wow. Now we have another question from Paul. Um, let's discuss the different types of fixed fire systems and gas suppressing agents on board. Okay, Glenn. Yeah, sure. I'll probably answer that one for you. Okay. So the majority of the fire systems that we find on board vessels have a clean agent gas. We've been discussing a lot about dry chemical. That's what's in the portable fire extinguishers. But inside the fixed fire systems will be a clean agent gas specifically designed to put out B-rated fires, which is flammable liquids, which is what you'd find in an engine room. Okay. Those gases are odorless, colorless, they leave no residue. So if it was to discharge in an engine room, it wouldn't make a mess. Obviously, you, you, you'd have a slight residue, but nothing like a dry chemical fire extinguisher. Those fire systems are obviously subject to different regulations and different schedule of service based on what's inside. There is carbon dioxide, CO2, there is uh, FM200, also known as HFC227. There is uh, all the chemical names. Novec1230 is another gas. Each one of these fire systems has a different gas, but they all fundamentally work the same. So if a broker is at a vessel and they have a fixed fire system, the best thing to do is contact the company, have them come in, inspect that system, and then they can give them the information they need on if the system is okay, what service it needs, or if it's you know fit for purpose because if you try and figure it out yourself without the training you won't know what you're doing okay speaking of inspections you all do that here and i understand you're fully licensed and insured and there's a lot of certifications that you have to go through for that i'm sure uh, absolutely the um the equipment on board the vessel obviously has to be inspected and to make sure it's fit for purpose and it's going to function correctly if the owner operator or a crew member or somebody was to look at that and say oh, it looks okay to me that's all well and good, but 
at the end of the day, if there's an incident on board, somebody's going to come in and say, well, who inspected this piece of equipment? Who's, who said it was okay? And that's where we come in. We are a licensed, certified, authorized company, insured and qualified. So when someone says, well, who inspected that piece of equipment? Well, Glenn did from Fire Ranger. They say, and Glenn has these approvals with ABS, Bureau of Veritas, Lloyd's Register, the manufacturer, NFPA, he holds a permit through the state. Then they say, okay, fair enough. He knows what he's doing. Fair enough, I, I trust him. He's got the qualifications needed. So the liability is there on me because I have the training. So that's why you need a qualified, licensed, insured company to do it, which is exactly what we do. That's how we make our money. Great. Now, yeah. do you provide any training here? We will do basic training. We have a strategic partnership with Resolve Maritime Academy. So any kind of crew training that's needed for the vessel, we direct them straight to uh, Resolve Maritime Academy. They, okay. they do the most comprehensive training in the area. So we always work with them. We, we also provide onboard training for crew as well to how to use their equipment. Part of the inspection process is we show them how to operate the fire suppression system. Fire suppression systems in engine rooms most commonly will, offer, uh, will operate two ways, either automatically or manually. Automatically, the system should go off at a certain temperature. So if the, if the heat rises in the engine room due to fire, the system should go off automatically. It can also be pulled manually, where most fire suppression systems will have a manual pull station. So we will train the crew on board where those pull stations are, what to do in case of a fire, how to evacuate the area, and how to follow the procedures in case they need to pull the pull station to get it operate. So we offer training to the crew. Our technicians get trained at the factories for the manufacturers that we represent and for the certifications that we hold. And we also have our own training room here where we train as well. Let's take a look at the training room. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Follow me. So you mentioned that there is a chemical system and CO2 and things like that. Now, I'm no scientist here, but I know that uh, let's say oxygen fuels a fire. So there are different types of gases that can put out a fire. Is that what I'm hearing? There are, yes. There's, okay. there's certain chemical agents that displace oxygen. Okay. So that's how they suppress the fire, by displacing oxygen. CO2 is one of those agents. Um, Interesting. But the newer gases, they don't displace oxygen. They rapidly cool the space. So if somebody was inside the hazard area when it went off, it wouldn't cause any asphyxiation. They would, they would be see. able to breathe it. Okay. So, that, you know, agents, as they progress, they get better and better each time. You know, they, they have a technolog technological advances and then they get better and better. Sure. Original so, halon that was, that was out, which is the most common name that people refer to clean agent gas, was very good at putting out fires, but it could be poisonous in certain circumstances. And it was also very bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. As time progresses and, and new methods of manufacture come into um, to effect, there's obviously been lots of different types of gases that have taken over that, and that we're now at the most uh, common um, modern type, which is called Novik 1230, which, as Glenn says, um, changes the, um, the reaction temperature in a fire, which, which puts a fire out, but you can also stand in a room and breathe it, and it also has virtually zero ozone, uh, ozone or environmental impact. So wow. it's good for the environment, and, yeah. it, and you can stand in a room and breathe zero, zero carbon footprint. Great. Which is great for today. Great. In so now month. what are we looking at here? This is our... Uh, employee training room. We do our own in-house training room for OSHA, for manufacturer's guidance, for our continued education. These are mock-up of different types of fire suppression systems that the technicians will work on. The most common one that you probably see in, in the marine industry would be this one here, which would be a Sea Fire, which is one of the biggest manufacturers. They're based out of Baltimore, Maryland, and they ma manufacture the most, one of the most common types of uh, fire suppression system that you see in an engine room. Glenn is our superstar on Sea Fire systems, so I'll let him explain the parts that work. So you asked earlier about suppression systems. This is, a, this is a basic fundamental suppression system. So this will be mounted in your engine room. Okay. And this fire system is filled with enough suppressing agent or gas to competently flood the engine volume. There's a thermal bulb in the top of the fire unit and that reaches an ambient temperature, a set temperature, and it melts. And this entire cylinder empties in under 10 seconds. With that emptying, this little pressure switch, monitor pressure switch, will energize a relay box, and that relay box will shut down engines, blowers, generators, any machinery within the space, and sound alarms, and get let me know that it's discharged. So that's essentially how they work. That is your most basic fundamental suppression system. Wow. But it's all good. You look at it, the gauge is in the green, and everyone says, oh, it's good, it's in the green, but it's, there's a lot more involved in it than that. We do need to take it out of its bracket assembly. We need to weigh it. We need to test that the manual capability is functioning correctly. We need to conduct this shutdown test. We need to make sure the bracket is housed correctly. 
there's a, there's a lot of points that we need to go over to make sure it's fit for purpose. It's not just a case of looking at the gauge. And that's, that's the thing that we need to come in to do if the vessel's for sale, if it's had a survey, if they're getting a new insurance carrier, anything like that, that's going to be needed. They're going to, it's going to come up and say, you need to get that fire system inspected and certified by a licensed company. Great. I'm sure that's a, a common misconception. You see it in the green and you just assume it's fine. Exactly. And then another big thing, I brought this for you so I could show you. Oh, okay. So obviously we affix a certification tag to the unit. Okay. So quite often we will, we, we punch the unit the day that we were there. So in April 2021, we serviced and inspected this fire suppression system. Okay. It then expires 12 months from that date. Quite often people will read the punch of the year and the punch of the month and believe that's a um, expiration date, but it's oh, not. It's 12 months, 12 from, months that date. from that date. Okay. So that's, a, that's another thing we get a lot of calls on and we have to educate people on that. Okay, interesting. No problem. Thank you for sharing that with me. All right. <laughs> Souvenir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I don't give you anything. Awesome. <laughs> let's take a look at the rest of the facility. Okay, you can head out forward towards the... Um, let's take a look at the LSA room for other okay. services. Okay, that okay. I will way. follow you this way. All right. So the next question from Paul is about the new USCG extinguisher code requirements. Can okay. you tell us a little bit about that and yeah. what USCG stands for? Absolutely. So USCG would be United States Coast Guard. Okay. And I'll oh, try I and, have known that. And I'll try and, I'll try and make <laughs> this as simple as I can. Coast Guard used to um, rate a fire extinguisher B1, B2, B3, depending on how efficient the fire extinguisher was. Okay. There's another rating by UL, Underwriters Laboratory, and they rate a fire extinguisher with certain units of A, certain units of B, and certain units of C, just like we talked about the different types of fire. So a fire extinguisher may be a B1 in Coast Guard, but it's got a 2A40 BC rating with UL. So now they have come across and they are recognizing the UL rating. So what it means, if you cut all that out, what it means is when you are buying your fire extinguishers for your vessel, you may not need as many as you needed before, and you maybe have different fire extinguishers. So when you're decking the vessel out with equipment, it's important that you've got a company that knows those codes because or else you're buying more than you need or you know, buying the wrong equipment. I see. So it has changed and it has, uh, it has been adapted and it's a little easier for the end consumer actually. Okay. Let me just stress though about buying more extinguishers than you need. We would always recommend you have more. A Coast Guard regulation, as the same with any sort of regulation, would tell you what the minimum is required. But I would, people look quite often ask us, how big a fire extinguisher do I need? And we say, well, how big a fire are you going to have? <laughs> so if you want to have a little rinky dinky fire, get a little rinky dinky fire extinguisher. But a little cute one, put out little cute fires. But you're probably going to have a big fire, in which case you want to have a big fire extinguisher. So when people say, what do I need on board the vessel? The Coast Guard regulations are for the minimum requirements. Yeah. Insurance requirements, that's the minimum you need but we would always recommend you have above and beyond that if your budget can afford it. Absolutely. And then, and then the, only, the other thing when we do our training with fire extinguishers that we purchased, we always explain, you know, you want to buy a fire extinguisher. If you want to get something bigger that you can handle, you've got to be able to feel comfortable and confident handling it. There's no point in buying something that you can't lift up. You don't understand how to use it. So we make sure you understand what you have, how to use it, and you're confident and comfortable working with it. Right. So now what room is this? So, Part of the other aspect of um, vessel service is there's fire extinguishers and there's fixed fire systems, but the vessels also have fire and safety items related to fire and safety, like immersion suits, also known as Gumby suits or anti-exposure suits. Mm -hmm. They have uh, breathing apparatus. They have fire suits because obviously the crew aboard the vessels have to do their own firefighting. They've had training, but that fire equipment needs to be inspected and maintained. Uh, there's also um, SCBA cylinders, there is um, rigid inflatable life jackets. All that equipment is subject to inspection every year under the jurisdiction of the vessel. So we make sure that equipment is inspected and maintained in accordance with the uh, applicable code, you know, depending on the vessel. Great. So you do it all here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, um, there's small emergency escape breathing devices that, you know it, it's never ending anything to do with fire and safety is going to fall under that absolutely that umbrella a, a simple inflatable life jacket has to operate at all times they have replaceable cartridges replaceable bobbins that set them, set them off they have flashlights 
all this equipment is in, it has to be inspected and tested once a year. So if you go in the water with a life jacket, you know it's going to work. So that's what we do. When we test them, we make sure all this equipment is working. Any equipment, you can see the corrosion here on this, on this cartridge. Yeah. You can see this cartridge has always been, also been used. There's a hole inside it. This would need to be replaced. And that is what is all part of the annual inspection. So it's not only fire extinguishers, it's also life safety appliances that we can inspect and certify. Wow. And we're, we have the same approvals for fire extinguishers and fire suppression systems as we do for life safety appliances with ABS and Lloyds and Bureau Veritas. Great. Now, it's very important, of course, for the crew to be educated on this topic because if you're out at sea, you can't call 911 and say, you know, come put out our fires. That's <laughs> what we always explain. Most The alarm goes off. Most people go to the parking lot and take a break for right. 10 minutes. And <laughs> can't then, do uh, that in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> absolutely not. They've got, to, they've got to know what they're doing. And they, it's OK having the best training in the world. But if the equipment that's on board the vessel does not function correctly, then it doesn't matter how good the training is. So that's why it's imperative that it gets serviced correctly. You know? Absolutely. And, and being trained on how to use the most basics of equipment is important, like being trained on how to use a fire extinguisher. Have you ever used a fire extinguisher? I have not, Ooh, but like I'm going to learn today. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Let's then. go. Let's right, try it out. Me. <laughs> Let's see, and I know there are some new types of products that are coming out, such as lithium ion battery fires and special fire extinguishers for that sort of thing. Correct. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, there's um, something that's obviously new to us is all the batteries in cell phones, batteries in e-cigarettes, uh, lithium ion batteries in um, uh, in uh, uh, computers, hand tools, everything computers, now. hand tools, all that sort of stuff. So those fire extinguishers they've uh, developed a fire extinguisher called an AVD fire extinguisher, which is your triple word score for the day. That's aqueous vermiculite dispersion. I will never remember that. There's a good word that. for you. <laughs> and uh, specifically designed to work on a, on a lithium ion battery. It will, it will coat the battery. It will main, uh, contain it so that you don't get thermal runaway, which is where one cell heats up, ignites, and burns the next cell. And it just keeps perpetuating and going and going. So those extinguishers are on the market. Um, we're one of the only companies that has that extinguisher available now. So we've been profiling it at, a, at all the um, South Florida boat shows um, and, uh, and, and bringing it, making everybody aware of it because Great. it's definitely something that is going to be needed in the industry sooner rather than later. Right, because a regular extinguisher wouldn't put out a lithium ion battery fire, correct? Correct, just because of, of the heat. That wow, it, good to it, know. It can do it. That's, yeah. that's a fun fact I learned today. I did not know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's get you out and fire extinguisher. Okay, let's do it. I'm ready. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's bring you over here so we're in a, a safe area. Okay. Set okay, so we talked here. about different types of fire extinguishers. Yes. We talked about different colors. We These did. two fire extinguishers here are two completely different colors and completely different types. This here is a water fire extinguisher. Fires just straight water that you can get straight out of the faucet. And that's why it only has a type A rating. You can only use it on trash, wood and paper. Okay? okay. This fire extinguisher here is a CO2. This extinguisher has a B and a C rating. It's designed for electrical fires and gasoline and liquid fires. Hmm. The reason we use these most commonly for training is because as we spoke about ABC powder earlier, it's very, very good at putting out a fire, but it's also very, very messy. I These see. extinguishers are good for training because you can be able to see how they work, how they operate, and then they don't make too much mess. Okay. Okay. All right, so <laughs> you haven't done this before. Right? I have never done okay, this before. Good. Okay. <laughs> this is good. Okay. Okay. Every fire extinguisher is designed exactly the same way for a novice to be able to operate it. Okay. Okay. You have here, which is the, the safety pin. You have to pull that pin out, which I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute. Okay. You have here the hose, which you're going to aim at the base of the fire. You're then going to squeeze a handle and sweep. That's okay. an acronym called PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. Pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep, okay? Okay. So we're gonna presume that this beautiful Florida palm tree right here is on fire. Oh, you're gonna grab this pipe and you're gonna, first thing you're gonna do is gonna remove the safety seal. You're gonna get okay. that and just rip it off, okay? Get this. Okay, I'll rip it off. Rip it off. There you go. Okay. Perfect, now pull out the pin. Pull out the pin. Okay, that's it. Now okay. take out the hose. And you're going to ho hold the hose in your strong hand. That's it. It'll snap right out. My strong hand. You're going to yeah. aim it at the base of the palm tree. Okay. I pick it up. Aim, aim no, that you, one can, down. Well, you don't have to. I don't you have can to. if you want to. Aim that one down. Aim okay. And you're going to squeeze that handle down. Okay. Ready? Go. Ready. Oh, wow. And then you sweep and you cover the fire. Sweep and cover the so fire. So you blanket the base of the fire. The base of the fire. Not the flames. Huh. 
Wow. How easy was that? Easier than I thought it would be. I thought it was going to have kickback or something. But some of them wow. do, and some okay. of them are a lot noisier, which is this one here. So this one is the most common that you would see okay. in movies and TV shows. Yes. Because it looks really cool. Okay. Okay. This is going to shoot out a cloud of CO2. Okay. Okay. Which is a different agent in the water, but sure. it doesn't make a mess either. So it works exactly the same way. So you're going to pull the tab off, snap okay. that tab off. There you go. Pull out the pin. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're going to raise that hose. There you go. Okay. Right. Yep. okay. You can pick this one up now. Okay. Before we start, this will be very noisy, okay? And there okay. might be a little bit of kickback, little okay? Kickback. Okay, on three screens. Okay. One, two, three, go. Wow. And as you can see, cool. zero agent. It's wow. gone. Okay. So imagine if that was in a fire suppression system and you just sprayed that in the engine room you wouldn't even know you sprayed it. Right, yeah, I always thought it was like a, a foam or something that came out. Some of them are foam, some okay. of them are dry chemical, some of them are gas, some of them are CO2, and some of them are water. Now, wow. with the way most fire extinguishers are placed and designed on board is that a company that has put them in the right locations would have the right extinguisher for the right hazard. So you would normally have the clean agent extinguishers inside the engine room because you wouldn't want to be filling an engine room with powder because you wouldn't be able to see your way out. If you're in the galley, you'd have a fire extinguisher specifically designed for cooking oils. If you're in an electrical room, you'd have a BC extinguisher. So that's why it's very important not just to buy a fire extinguisher, you want to have the right extinguishers for the right application. Fantastic. Well, I learned a lot today and I used a fire extinguisher for the first time. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, hopefully you never do have to use one, but if you do, hopefully not. Um, or if you have any questions, just give us a call at Fire Ranger. We'd be happy to help you out. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. We'll send it back to you, Paul. Florida Nautical Surveyors is your complete solution to all your vessel surveying needs. Our team of seasoned experts led by Malcolm Elliott are the go-to solution for pre-purchase, insurance, or valuation surveys. Whether your vessel is steel, aluminum, fiberglass, wood, or even ferro-cement, our surveyors have the knowledge and training to meet all of your surveying needs. Call Florida Nautical Surveyors today at 954-801-2140. Or for more information, go to floridanauticalsurveyors.com. Our industry has learned that to control your data is to control your destiny. Yachtbroker.org is the key to that control. As a member of any professional yachting association, when you input your data, you are the owner of that information. At yachtbroker.org, you can keep track of all data reports related to your company by viewing your customized live management dashboard. Create an eye-catching photo gallery with our new thumbnail editor. Follow vessels of your liking to get status notifications in current time. Identify special commission conditions immediately. And even report a vessel to our team and the listing broker. Need to have access to your fleet on the go? Yachtbroker.org is completely mobile optimized, so you can view and edit your listings from anywhere in the world. For more information on how you can get started using yachtbroker.org, give us a call at 954-522-9270 or email me at casey at iyba.org. Marine Professionals MPI has been in business since 1997. With over 20 years of experience, we at MPI provide you the very best in marine electronics, audio, video, and networking. We specialize in boats from 40 to 120 feet. If you need navigation, including Garmin, Raymarine, or any other top brands, MPI is your go-to source. If you need audio video equipment, MPI can provide you with HD TV and the very best sound with a Sonos Hi-Fi sound system. MPI is the only marine gold Sonos dealer in the country. Nowadays, everybody wants high-speed internet. MPI can offer you different solutions that fit your needs. Whether it's to pick up the marina Wi-Fi, cellular, or satellite, MPI has you covered. We'll make sure you can binge watch your favorite Netflix episodes anywhere, anytime you want. You can check us out online at marineprofessionals.com or call us today. I'm Mark Carreri and I approve this message. At Murray Ventilation Products, we bring over 20 years of experience providing ventilation and air filtration solutions. MVP is your most valuable player in demisters, intake and exhaust fans, and computer-controlled safety systems. We are well-equipped to provide end-to-end -end solutions for OEMs and refit projects the world over. Call Murray Ventilation Products today 
at 772-631-2229. Maritime arbitration has been around for hundreds of years. Now we have a new forum to solve our disputes. The IYBA has created the International Yacht Arbitration Council to solve our disagreements. We have experienced maritime attorneys and yacht brokers to serve on our panels, people who know the law, who know boats, and who know the yacht business. IYAC arbitration can handle yacht claims, contract, purchase, and commission disputes privately, quickly, and less costly than going to court. Sometimes disputes happen, and when they do, the IYAC is here to help you solve them. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for day four of Yacht Engineering Week. We had an opportunity to learn about paints. We talked about connectivity with Isotropic. And Heather, I think you learned how to put out a fire. I sure did. And that's it for day four. We have one more day of Yacht Engineering Week 2021. We will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. See you then. Yacht Engineering Week 2021 has been made possible by Pantropic Power, the only authorized Caterpillar Power Systems dealer in South Florida. Florida Nautical Surveyors, your complete solution to all of your vessel surveying needs. And Robert Allen Law, exclusively dealing with the business of yachting. We would also like to thank Quantum Stabilizers, AME Solutions, D'Angelo Exhaust, MPI Marine Professionals Incorporated, Concord Marine Electronics, Lauderdale Marine Center, Marine Data, Isotropic, Dockmate, and Murray Ventilation Products. Thanks for joining us. See you tomorrow.